Greetings, Zimbabwe, Africa, and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with Dr. Simba Makoni, Zimbabwe's former Minister of Finance, a farmer, and a politician. Enjoy this fascinating conversation. <music> Dr. Simba Makoni, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. I'm so glad that you were able to leave your farm and come and spend time with us in the city. It's a pleasure, Trevor, to be here, to be talking to you and all those who will be watching, listening. Thank you very much for having me. So let's, let's thank you so much. Let's, let's go to the farm where you've just come, come from. I mean, I've visited your farm. Uh, and very impressive. How long have you been doing the farming for? This is year 20 now. Wow, that's yeah. quite a long time. And what are you what are you doing? Well, our mainstay is tobacco. Yeah. We grow tobacco. Uh, we grow maize. We grow wheat mm -hmm. when we have water mm -hmm. for irrigation. We raise beef cattle. We have a small dairy herd that we milk just for our own farm use. Mm -hmm. But our main activities are beef cattle, tobacco, and cereal. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what, what do you consider to be the main challenges right now? What is it that you're battling with apart from the, the weather? Really, the absence of market financial instruments to support agriculture mm -hmm. and the difficulties in procuring inputs mainly mm -hmm. are our biggest challenges. And um, are you seeing any hope in um, command agriculture and its various uh, uh, permutations at all? Well, our agriculture currently, except for the major estate operators, mm. is contract-based. Right. And command is one form of contract. Until the economy normalizes and particularly people are able to raise financing in the market, Contract farming is going to be the thing, including command farming. Mm. Um, it's not the ideal, even with private contractors. Farmer really needs his freedom to decide what he borrows from who he borrows for how long. Mm. And our current environment doesn't provide for that. So what, what, would, <coughs> what would the ideal look like for you uh, were that to be in place? Well, uh, when I started farming, 20 years ago. We could still go into the market and borrow yeah. on your farm's title deeds, mm -hmm. on your other assets. You can't do that much at the moment. Mm -hmm. And it, we it, haven't been able to do that since the uh, fast track land reform program. Is this because you, you, you don't have collateral because of uh, the uh, fast track land reform uh, program? Mainly, yes, because all rural agricultural land is now state land. Mm. And so you cannot use it as collateral for borrowing. Mm. That's the one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is the state of our financial sector. Mm. There are very few financial institutions that are able to lend commercially mm. for any business, let alone for farming business, in a long term especially, if you want to invest right. in irrigation, in curing facilities, you can't borrow in our market. You may be able to borrow short-term working capital, mm. but under very heavy conditions. That sounds like we are in a cul-de-sac of some sort. Unfortunately, yes, for the foreseeable. As I say, until we normalize the economy such that facilities can be raised in the financial sector and procurement can be normal in the manufacturing sector, fertilizers, chemicals. Uh, as you know, we're currently now 100% dependent on imports. Mm -hmm. Even inputs that we can produce here, like base fertilizers, ammonium fertilizers, it's now being imported from Belarus, from China, from South Africa. And so that pipeline of procurement mm -hmm. and the costing of it 
present significant hurdles mm. for the farmer. Mm. So you're facing two headwinds. One is the financing side. Mm -hmm. The other one is the inputs, uh, the fertilizer, the seeds, and, and all that kind of stuff. None of that seems to be uh, in a place to, to, to help your productivity. N not at the time you want it. Um, I've been looking for my fertilizers for my summer maize crop now for the past 10 days. <laughs> it's not available for one reason or another. And, and this it, is might, it on, might be raining pretty soon. This is on a contract mm. program. Mm. So if I were doing it independently, it would be even more difficult. So what, what <coughs> is it that we need to do, Simba, to unblock those issues that you are, you are highlighting now on the financing side, on, on the input side? Trevor, this is a loaded question. Yeah. I could answer it in <laughs> one word. I could answer it the whole day. Basically, we need to get our country working mm. normally. Mm. Mm. Like I said earlier, we need the financial system to be efficient, effective. But more importantly, mm. we need to make our country work normally. Mm. The relations between leaders and the led, relations among citizens, relations between companies and their clients, mm. ultimately relations among people. Um, you can then draw it down to what does it mean. Mm. Basically, let, let's have the country work such that citizens can pursue their daily chores, survival, issues without impediment mm. and the environment for doing that whether it is a farming business a publishing business mm. like yours or a mining business mm. we, we're facing too many hurdles so simba you saying we need to fix the entire economy the society the way we are organized for us to be able to get people like you to be productive on the farms. And we're far away from that. Unfortunately, yes. Um, it's not just people like me on the farms. It's the whole country. Mm. Like I said, whether it is a publishing business or a mm. manufacturing mm. business, a retail business, we're operating in a very, very hostile environment. It reflects even on the output of our employees, mm. of our workers. Mm. Their attitude to work, their output when they get to work, uh, whether it's in a factory or on a farm or in a mine, it's all affected by the environment we have created over the last 20 years plus, some would say even over the last 40 years mm. of our independence. So we do have a, a lot of work to do, particularly those of us who claim to be leaders of the country even if we are leaders at a community level, leaders in an area, in a ward, in a district, even leaders of football teams. You know, this affliction that has come to our country and our nation shows itself in every sphere of our lives. It's not just in politics, it's not just mm -hmm. in business. Even in the church, mm -hmm. this thing that I call power, control, and command mm. is the root cause of it all. So essentially, I mean, I, I'm reflecting because this, this is, like you said, you could answer it in one sentence or you could um, break it up all. It can be a PhD like, thesis. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and the way you've done, you've done Simba, you've, you've just opened it up and it, it speaks to leadership or the lack thereof mm. all across. And uh, you begin to wonder what it is that we are doing as a country when we get up every morning uh, with all these challenges. I mean, I am I am particularly drawn to where you say even those the workers, the staff, in terms of application. Mm -hmm. So the the notion that we are enterprising, the notion that we have an amazing work ethic, the no notion that we have productivity, all that is premised on a lie at the moment. That's in the past. Mm. 
it's a, an ideal we should aspire to regain. It's what we used to be. Yes, that's what we used to be. We were very hardworking. We were very honest. We were very trustworthy. Mm -hmm. We were very caring and compassionate. We're not that anymore. Not the majority of us anyway. Mm -hmm. And certainly not those of us in leadership. Mm -hmm. What's happened to us, Simba? We have changed. We have changed because of our appetite for power. And we have changed because of our avarice for material things. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I, I think when we begin to associate a position of authority and responsibility with material well-being and acquisitions, that's when the rot set in. Mm. But correct me if I'm wrong, but there's two of us, um, at least as you're talking, which, which, who I can identify now. There's the leaders and the led. Have all been crippled by the factors that you're outlining now? Yes, because the rot set in the leadership mm -hmm. and it then percolated into society as a whole mm -hmm. because the behavior the personality, the character that our leadership took mm. is what we then fed into those we lead. Mm. So we became power hungry, we became cruel, we became greedy, we became corrupt, and that went from the leadership into our total society. Mm. Degrees will vary. No villager from Madambuzi will try to take out six kgs of gold, mm. but she will try to get a bucket of maize mm. or a goat. So the magnitude or degree of corruption, greed, will not be the same at the different levels of our society. Mm. But the lowest common denominator is we are all now what I've just described. No longer trustworthy, no longer hardworking, no longer honest, and very greedy and cruel. We're a broken society, Simba. Unfortunately, yes. Mm. How, how do we fix this? Um, I mean, again, that's a thesis. <laughs> but let's try and break it down. How do we begin to fix this at the leadership level at the men and women on, on the street. How do we begin to fix this society? You know, the old saying goes, every journey starts with the first step. Mm. In this journey, the first step is to acknowledge that we have a problem. And unfortunately, in our country, certainly in our leadership, there's no acknowledgement that we have a problem mm. or that we have problems. Mm. So you can't start fixing what doesn't exist for you. In the few occasions when we acknowledge that we have a problem, we pass the buck. It's not our fault. Mm. We didn't cause it. It was caused by somebody else. If it's in the family, it's Babamkur. Mm. If it's in the community, Mawakizani, our next door neighbors. Mm. If it's this country, it's our detractors mm. from outside. So, if you don't acknowledge, accept, recognize that you have a problem, you can't solve it. Mm. So I would say the first step is to accept that mm. we do have mm. a myriad of problems. Mm. Mm. And, and again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that acceptancy requires the leadership to accept that we've got a problem. It requires the men and the women in the street to also be made aware that we are a broken society and that we need fixing. But my sense, uh, Simba, is that the denial is all across the board. Yes. The men and the women on the street thinks we are okay. The leadership has told us that we are okay, therefore we are okay. We walk, we're walking broken and we're refusing to admit it. How can we be helped? We have to help ourselves. But before that, let me just say, I read, I sense, I feel two personalities in the Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the one who outwardly 
is what you've just described. Mm -hmm. The one in denial. Mm. The one whose fault it isn't mm. for the situation we're in. Mm. And then the one who is honest to himself and herself when there are just the two of you or three of you or five of you in the family who will say, hey, this country is broken. Mm. We are in we are serious broken. trouble. So it depends on where we are, mm. who we are with, mm. and who we are communicating to. That we take the denial character or the realistic and honest character. Mm. But among the leaders, mm. unfortunately, this duality doesn't exist much. Very few leaders, even in private, will acknowledge now that we have problems. Mm. There was a time when if there were two or three or four of you, I used to say, if there are five or six ZANU-PF members together, they will be saying, e, we are in trouble, what must we do? Mm. The moment we get to ten or more, there is no problem. Mm. So among our leaders, the denial is more entrenched than it is among the population. In, in both in government and the opposition, is that your sense? All leaders. Mm -hmm. Not just leaders in politics, mm. even leaders in business. Mm. Mm. Chief executive will not acknowledge that the bottom line is disappearing mm. and he will go and buy a luxury car, mm. even though he can't pay wages at the end of the month. Mm. So what, what do we do, Simba? I mean, uh, this is such a huge problem. If we can not look ourselves in the mirror as a nation and as a people and that meet, like you're saying, in the first instance, we're broken, we need fixing, and then we discuss how do we get fixed. How are we going to get over this thing? Well, it requires that those of us who accept our current state must work hard to convince the rest of us who don't accept this current state. Mm -hmm. I don't see us doing it any other way. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think it requires those of us who acknowledge our reality <coughs> to share it, to share that reality, particularly with our young people, mm. so that they don't continue to grow in the same state of mind that we are in, the denial state. So there are two levels of work. Mm. I would put more emphasis on what work we must do with our young people. Mm. And what, what is that work, as far as you're concerned? Basically talking to and showing by deeds what is right. Mm. That's how I see it. H have we not poisoned them to the extent that that in itself is going to be a big thing to do? What's your experience? I know you do this uh, from time to time. Yes, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But anything that's labeled work, it's hard. Mm -hmm. There is no easy work. There is no light work. So I agree, it's not going to be easy. Mm. The environment is not conducive to the kind of venture that I am proposing. Mm. The environment is very hostile. <clears throat> Everybody wants the easy life. We want lots of money that we haven't worked for. Mm. So, but that it is not going to be easy shouldn't deter us, mm -hmm. at least from trying, mm -hmm. hopefully from doing the best we can. Because if we don't, then we are condemning this nation, particularly future generations, not even your child and my child, but maybe your granddaughter and great-grandson may have a chance. That's how far them. gone we are. Yeah. And, and Simba, is there any difference between that um, abnormality within the opposition and the ruling party, or is it just the same thing? I'm describing the, the Zimbabwean society mm. as I see it. Mm. I'm not putting people in paddocks. Mm. But as I said earlier, this reflects itself in politics, it mm. reflects itself in business, it mm. reflects itself in society, mm. in the church. When you watch the fights that go on in our football clubs. Mm. It's not about kicking a football. Mm. It's about who gets to the cookie jar first. 
And that's what's driving many of us mm. in our everyday lives. So it's not just about politics, but yes, it is the same in opposition politics as it is in so-called ruling party politics. It's our politics, what I call toxic politics, mm. the politics of power, control and command. Mm. The, the, sorry to belabor the point, um, which is the leadership deficit, Simba, from what you're saying, is all across the board, like you've said. It's in the church, it's in the corporate world, it's in the political parties, it's in the football, uh, in the fo football arena. That's what we need to face as a nation. This is my description mm. of the Zimbabwean nation. Mm. Currently, mm. Simba, let me take you back to um, when you were appointed um, the youngest uh, deputy minister uh, uh, in uh, 1980 at Independence. You were 30 years uh, old then. When you look back, what you've just described right now is stuff that has taken place over the past 40 years. When you look back at when you are appointed to where you are or you are right now, what goes through your mind? Mixed feelings, Trevor. Mm. The first strong feeling is one of regret mm. that we've taken our country and our people down this path. We had an opportunity to create a heaven on earth. Mm. Um, the other feeling is one of uh, gratitude mm. that I was offered the opportunity to serve my people and my country at such an early age. Let me digress a little bit. Mm. You know I studied chemistry. Yeah. And my ambition was to go and work in a chemistry lab to extract the active ingredients from our traditional medicines. I didn't have a chance to do it. I tell people I have a PhD certificate hanging on the wall, but I never practiced it. So at that age, I felt grateful, somewhat even daunted that I was being asked to do this. If, uh, uh, you have the time, I'll share my exchange with Prime Minister Mugabe then. Please do, please do. Um, the government Let's was have the conversation. The government was formed when I was out of the country. And I came back a week after the whole cabinet had been, uh, uh, what do they call it? Put they? together. Yes. And they had taken their awards. So the late Ino Sankala, uh, the late T.G. Silundika and I, we had been sent to the OAU because there was a suspicion the elections were going to be rigged. And so the OAU had planned a special meeting mm. to deal with that. So we went to represent the Patriotic Front. So the government was formed when we were still out there. And when we came back, we were offered the opportunity to go and take our oath. So waiting for the formality, I said to Prime Minister Mugabe, but some of us we're not expecting this. If we were not going to pursue what we studied, maybe we were going to be at the party offices to work to strengthen the party. And he said to me, we have a lot of important work to do and I have determined who is the best hands for that. Literally. Mm. So I accepted it. And yes, looking back now, uh, one had an opportunity to make a contribution. I strived to. Mm -hmm. I hope I succeeded somewhat. But uh, the greater feeling is one that says we didn't do our work mm -hmm. properly as leaders. That's why our country is in the morass it is right now. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of people will not know. I mean, um, in as much as I didn't, Simba, until I started reading around. Uh, you that you've got a BSc in chemistry and zoology, am I right? That's correct. You've got a PhD in medicinal and pharmaceutical chemistry, and that's the regret that you have. 
that you have this certificate that you never pursued in terms of uh, 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 profession, if the profession is concerned. You were then got involved in politics. That's essentially what you're saying. Yes. A regret that I didn't pursue that dream mm. because I believed very strongly that at some point we would be commercializing what we use to treat ourselves back in the village mm. and uh, in time. But I also don't regret that I was ushered into this mm. new terrain because one thing I share with youths is don't paddock yourself. Mm. Because if I had remained in the chemistry paddock, mm. maybe some of the things that I did in my life, including being mm. a farmer, may not have come. Sure. So uh, again, there are always two sides to a coin. Uh, and there is uh, the regret side that I didn't pursue my chemistry. Mm. And again, I share there was a time when I, I, when I got bored in cabinet, uh, I would pull out my notebook and I would start drawing my chemistry formula there. And I sat next to Frederick Shower, who would always tease me and say, you will never do that ever <laughs> again. And he, how right he was. So there is that, there is that point. But uh, like I said, especially to the young people watching, don't let the field mm. you study mm. limit your world. Mm. It shouldn't be a paddock mm. that stops you moving across. Because if I had said I studied chemistry, I must stay in the chemistry world, I might never have done all the many other things that I did. Mm. Was there a moment, Simba, when you started noticing that we are headed the wrong direction? Oh, yeah. There was. When yeah. was that? You know, the, the different signposts. Mm. What were the on, key ones? On our route. What were the key ones? You know, for me, in 1989, when Jeff Nyarota published Willowgate, mm. and the late President Mugabe landed at the airport. The, the, the story was published when he was out of the country, yeah. as he most uh, usually was. When he landed, he was asked what he thought about it. And he said, ah, what are people fussing about? They only motor cars. We're not as corrupt as the Nigerians, something to that effect. Mm. And I had occasion more than once to remind uh, the late President Mugabe when I had occasion to see him immediately after that, I reminded him of a Shona saying which says, Mwanawe nyoka inyoka. And I said, Comrade President, it's only a motor car this time around. But if we don't kill it, it will grow mm. and it will bite us big time. Mm. Look at where we are now. A Toyota Cressida isn't worth much compared to 6 kgs mm. of gold mm -hmm. Mm. and 15 billion worth of Marange diamonds and uh, backhanders on contracts to pave 200 kilometers of roads. Mm. So when you ask, is there a moment, there is not one, but quite clearly, I think we began to change noticeably in the latter half of the 80s into the early 90s. Mm. Our character became preoccupied with power, with control, and with accumulation. Mm. That's where I would put the starting line. Mm. And, and, and watching you uh, from, from a distance, there was a sense that you, as an individual, were getting uncomfortable, but could not see the exit door. No, um, I was getting uncomfortable, yes, and for quite a long time. I came back from SADC in 1994 oh. and reintegrated myself into the party structures initially at the provincial level up to the national level. And I could see that we were sliding down the wrong slope. Mm. Yes, I began to feel uncomfortable. But for a long time, I and many other comrades believed 
we could make change from within. Mm. So I persevered. So did many others who f believed we were going the wrong way mm. because we thought we could make change from within. Mm. By 2007, 2008, I realized the change we were making was not equal to the problem we were trying to solve. Mm. And that's when I jumped. Mm. And, and when you did, Simba, um, our court, you said um, um, when you announced that you were going to be an independent uh, candidate, I think you had tried to run within and uh, it was made clear that that wouldn't happen, uh, including by um, uh, the current president, uh, Emerson Nangagwa, that you had self um, ejected yourself out of the party. And, and you say that um, you had decided to run as an independent presidential candidate, but that this was not a St. Paul on the road to Damascus awakening. This has been a continuum, uh, incremental, things have been building up. Um, and that building up, I take it is the frustration with, I think we can change from within, mm. but that didn't happen. Indeed. Um, Trevor, I can recall very vividly the annual conference of ZANU-PF of 1994. I think it was held in Esigodini. Mm. Mm. That's the first time that comrades in the conference began to vocalize disquiet and discomfort with where we were going. As 1994. 1994. As a party and as a country as a party which formed the government that was leading the country. Mm -hmm. That's when I can recall that a number of us were very uncomfortable with the direction we were taking. And every year, every annual conference, every Congress, uh, we believed we could make change. And there was change at two levels, change at the policy level, what we were doing, and change at the individual leadership level, including at the helm of the party. By the time Mugabe said there was no vacancy, mm -hmm. he knew that there were people working for change at that yes. level. So that's what I mean by mm -hmm. it was a continuum. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something that just happened abruptly, mm -hmm. immediately. It was something that was building up over the years. 2006, for many of us, held promise for change. We had the conference at Goromonzi, and many people talk about the Goromonzi conference. There was a very strong feeling that sufficient ground had been covered to facilitate a smooth change within the party leadership so that we can have new leadership in the country. Mm. But even that didn't come to be. Would, did this involve um, the president, pre, former President Robert Mugabe stepping down and, and allowing a challenge to take place? That was the objective, mm. to get a new leader of the party mm. who could then form a new leadership team. Mm. The plan was to have emerging of the old and the new so that we can have a smooth transition. Mm. And why didn't it happen? What, what, what were you and your comrades, why didn't you do it? Um, it needed, what happened in 2017, mm. in a way, ironically, mm. that there was strong force within the party to propose a new candidate to replace the uh, incumbent. But fear came into play, mm. or intimidation. Uh, who would bail the cat, mm. literally? Wow. Is where it fell off on. Tell, tell me, is this fear of losing the trappings of power, or fear of uh, what is going to happen to you physically and materially when you are outside? Both. Okay. Trevor, you know, our people live in all kinds of fear, including fear of physical harm mm. or even loss of life. Mm. Because over the 40 years, we have experienced this. 
Uh, the youths may not know about times when people used to talk about uh, meeting an army truck mm -hmm. or hitting a black dog mm -hmm. or just falling into a trench. So the, the, there was and there still is fear of physical harm, including elimination. Mm -hmm. But there was also fear of losing power which led to gaining material well-being. Mm -hmm. um, I can recall conversations I had with comrades about what Jonathan Moyo ultimately called it's cold out there. Mm -hmm. Starting with do you have a motor car to drive? Can you put food on your table? Or can you enjoy the status of a chef? Mm -hmm. Where when you get to a place, everybody makes way and they serve you first. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fear of all those things. Mm -hmm. But fear of physical privation. Uh, I can put food on my table now. If I lose it, what do I do? I had a conversation with a colleague who was very unhappy. He was a minister, and he was very unhappy about what was happening in government. And I said to him, but why don't you leave? He says, ah, if I leave, what then do I do? I said, you have a PhD. Why can't you go and teach at the University of Zimbabwe? And he says, ah, then who will salute you? Wow. So he feared that he might not be able to earn enough to maintain the lifestyle he had. But he also feared that his personal standing might be reduced, mm. that nobody would salute him. Mm. So it's a whole range of fears. When you go down to the level of the so-called ordinary man and woman in the street, they fear that they may not be able to hold their mall at Mbari Musika to sell their vegetables. Mm because some youths will come and demolish the, 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 the vegetable more. Or that this market they have been allocated will be taken away from them, and they therefore won't be able to raise money to send their child to school or to pay for their electricity. What was your relationship like with um, the former president, Robert Mugabe? You, you then got appointed to be uh, Minister of Finance and Economic Development, but I'm interested in the relationship that you had, the chemistry of any. It was very good, mm -hmm. surprisingly. Mm -hmm. uh, it may sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet and I don't want to give that impression, mm -hmm. but you know, President Mugabe and I used to have very good conversations. I describe him as a man who enjoyed an argument. Mm -hmm. And so when we had discussions, they were very good stimulating, especially in the earlier years, before he got uh, on with the age. Because he liked to be challenged intellectually. Mm. He liked to feel that he had everything at his fingertips. So when I had meetings with him, they were very good meetings. We didn't agree many times. Mm. And I remember most of the time he would conclude the discussion by ah, Simba, as he would do most times, and occasionally, Comrade Makoni, let's just agree to disagree. It was a very good relationship. Mm. It was also quite personal. We spent a lot of time talking about families. Fortunately, he got to know my family when we were in the negotiations at Lancaster House. Mm. We had our first son, Takura. And Chipo was in the team of women that were providing for the delegation. And so she always had Takura on her back. And he got to know him and he liked him. And every time we met, the first thing we did for the first 30, 35 minutes was mm. talk about family. Mm. On his side and on my side. And then we would come to talk about uh, the business. So in summary, it was a very good, cordial mm. relationship. Mm. Again, I don't want to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but this is the only recollection I have of a time when President Mugabe felt he needed to explain a reshuffle. Because when I left the Minister of Finance, he was on ZTV to explain that I left of my own accord. We did not fire him. 
I do not want anybody to besmirch him or speak ill of him. Literally, verbatim. Mm. If these tapes are still there, somebody can search that up. Mm. I don't recall any time when a minister left office that Mugabe felt he needed to explain it. Mm. Do, do you have instances where you felt you changed his mind? <laughs> That's a tough one, mm. uh, Trevor. There were a few things that he agreed with me, mm -hmm. but I doubt that I changed his mind. Okay. Because one of our very engaging conversations was around the issues we touched at the early mm -hmm. part of our conversation mm -hmm. about the leadership, leadership style, the content of our leadership, what I used to call it, mm -hmm. the content of our leadership. Comrade President, apart from holding these offices, what are we delivering to the people? Mm. That I don't think I succeeded at all. Mm. Uh, small things about a measure in the government, about uh, an activity in the party, mm. maybe. Mm. Am I right that you, when you, did you actually go and tell him that you were leaving the party? Am I right or I'm getting this wrong? No. Um, I didn't tell him I was leaving the party. Okay. I didn't use those words. Okay. But the conversation I had with him on January 21, 2008, which was followed a month later on February 5 by my announcement that I was going to contest the presidential election, mm. was the last real no-holds-barred conversation I had with him. Mm. I would summarize it as, Comrade President, if we don't change going into this election, we're going to lose. If we don't change our platform, if we don't change our team, those were the words I, I didn't say if you don't uh, resign, but the essence of it was if we don't put a new lineup, mm. we're going to lose. And when he rejected that, that was the last straw for me. And on February 5, I announced I was leaving the party. Mm. Well, I didn't say I was leaving the party because I still wished and hoped that I could contest as the party's candidate. Mm -hmm. Because I had wanted to achieve the change I believed we needed for the country from within the party. Mm -hmm. That uh, discussion we had earlier when I thought for a long time we could make change mm -hmm. from within. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised by the way he reacted publicly? and by the way your colleagues reacted to your, to your leaving the party and, and contesting as an pre, independent presidential candidate? No, I wasn't surprised by the way he reacted, but I was surprised by the way a number of my then comrades reacted. Mm. Um, the media have uh, all the time reminded me of something I didn't say. Uh, they said, I said, a lot of people were going to follow me. You never said that. I didn't say that. Okay. What I said was, I know that a lot of people are unhappy mm -hmm. with the state of the party and the state of the country. But I wasn't surprised by his reaction because what I did was directly challenging him, his position. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't take lightly mm -hmm. to being challenged. Mm -hmm.